Good afternoon, everybody uneducated economist here. So before I get started, I would like to give Henrik a big thank you for stopping by the store today and shaking my hand to let me know how much he enjoys the channel. Thank you very much, Henrik. I really appreciate that. I always do. Anytime a fan, you know, sends me that kind of appreciation, um, really lets me know that I'm doing things right here. So uh, thank you, man. Thank you for doing that. I uh, thought I would talk a little bit about the supply chain today. I came across this article I'd like to share with you guys, and there was a link within the article that I would also like to share with you guys that has come from the Federal Reserve talking about the supply chain and talking about the inflation that we have experienced over the, over the course since the pandemic, essentially. Now, I have been pretty adamant about saying most of the price inflation that we have experienced over the course of the last few years had come more from a supply chain breakdown than it came from the Federal Reserve and the monetary policies. Now, a lot of people argued with me on that. They said, how dumb can you be to see or to not be able to see that the Federal Reserve's money printer go burr, prices go up, right? I mean, what else do you need to look at? I have spent countless amounts of hours and videos talking about all the supply chain breakdowns that have taken place and I use lumber as my main example. We saw lumber go from 400 per thousand up to 1700 per thousand. Everybody pointed at lumber, said, look, money printer go burr, prices go up. Lumber is the prime example of this. No need to look any further. And at that time, I was one of the few people who was out there saying, nope, this is a supply chain breakdown. This will eventually go away and we are going to find prices come back down to a normal price. Here we are today. 460 per thousand on the lumber futures. So it was very little doubt in my mind that that was going to take place. I knew it, I could see it happening prior to the pandemic. We were putting out videos on this channel talking about inventory depletions, mill curtailments. It was, it was set up. I mean, it was totally set up. I don't know about the rest of the industries. I wasn't focused in on that, but I was definitely focused in on lumber and I knew that there was going to be an inventory depletion that was going to be a critical point coming into 2020. Then we had the pandemic, they shut the mills down because of all the COVID restrictions, and everybody pointed at that saying, that was the reason why we had such a lumber shortage. Mm -mm. Go back and watch my videos. I Throughout all of 2019, I was talking about mill curtailments and inventory depletions prior to the pandemic. So it was definitely, it was definitely a situation taking place prior to the pandemic that was going to result in something very similar to what we had experienced, right? Now, would it have been as bad? I doubt it. Had the money printer knock on burr and the stimulus checks gone out, would it have been as, you know, as bad as it had gone as far as the inventory depletions? Probably not, but they were heading our way anyway. And everybody pointed at the Federal Reserve and blamed the money printer for it. So now that I'm sitting in a situation with lumber where the lumber, where the prices are back down to normal and we are just now getting to a point where the inflation is starting to peak out, right? I mean, it's still incredibly high. People are still complaining about it. We still have issues with it, but we're starting to see the results of a, of a tighter monetary policy. Now, what I found interesting through all this is that there has been a major disruption to the way that the global in supply chain worked. Like pieces from all over the world that used to travel to try and get to a manufacturer has caused such a disruption that people are now sourcing out ever closer to their local area so they do not have to deal with the disruptions of a broken supply chain. There's a problem with this. The problem with that is, is that it is much more difficult to try and manufacture in a place that is expensive than it is to try and import a cheaper good. This is the Cantillon effect. This is probably one of the biggest things that a lot of people are not grasping, including the author of the article that I'm going to leave down in the description, because here's the problem with the Cantillon effect. All right? Now, you've heard me talk about this a lot of times. Most people, when they think about the, or a lot of people will call it Cantillon or Cantillon, I don't know. Anyway, it's Cantillon. He was a French guy, so that's the way he pronounced it, Cantillon. All right? So Richard Cantillon and the Cantillon effect, it goes something like this. When new money comes into the system, when that new money first starts entering, entering into circulation, the people who have access to that money, when they spend it, they're spending it at face value. They get to buy all the goods and services at the price that they would normally anticipate. As that money starts flowing through the system, 
by the pe by the time it gets to the end of the line, the people who are at the very end who get the money last, they suffer the most as all the prices of everything that's out there has gone up, but their wages have not. So they are stuck with higher prices and a lower standard of living. What ends up happening from this, if this new money continues to pour in, is that the people who have access to that money will continue to buy at that face value. If the prices go up because of the domestic manufacturing demand, right, because all these people are now have this money and they're asking for more stuff, if that demand starts to increase and the prices move up, foreign competition starts to come in. And now the people who have access to that money first, they don't want to spend it on higher priced goods and services. They want to spend it at face value. So they start buying that foreign imports, which starts driving out the domestic manufacturing. If this continues, if this new money flowing into the system continues, it will continue to drive in ever-increasing amounts of foreign imports and drive out ever-increasing amounts of domestic manufacturing, including the people who live there, the people who are at the bottom of the line. They have to go travel to someplace else in order to have that standard of living that, that they once enjoyed prior to the new money coming in and driving the prices up. So this is the Cantillon effect, right, as this starts to take place. Now, what Richard Cantillon talks about is that once the new money turns off, see, this is where the real problem is. Once the new money turns off, all that, all that new money that had been coming in and the people who had access to it, as they were driving in ever-increasing amounts of foreign imports and drove out the domestic manufacturing, they became reliant on those foreign imports. And once the new money turned off, so does the foreign imports. And once that happens, everybody falls into poverty. And this is a cycle that cannot be reversed. There's, I, I cannot find an example in history where they had gone into a position like the United States has. Well, first of all, there's never been a country that's gone into a position like the United States. But there's never been a time when new money coming into the system that has increased the standard of living of the people and started driving in import it, the foreign imports, there's never been an example of being able to reverse that back into domestic manufacturing without going into a complete collapse. At least I haven't found it yet. Now, they could exist out there. There might be examples of it, but I haven't seen it. Once that standard of living has increased and the, and the dive into luxuries, the people who have gone into you know enjoying all the luxurious items that are out there, once it turns off, everybody falls into poverty. It's like there's... There's no other way of going about it. So what I find interesting is when people start blaming Keynesian economics, right? They're saying, here's the problem with Keynesian economics. They just want to keep this system going. And now the author of this article that I leave, he leaves this paragraph. And this is, this is why I'm sure that a lot of people just don't get it, right? Because he says this. The UK should implement industrial policies to reduce imports, increase exports, and borrow less from abroad by growing a manufacture by growing and manufacturing more of its needs these do not need or these do not appear to be on their radar screen right so he is absolutely right this is what they need to do but they ain't going to do it you know why it's because everybody loves luxury see they want those luxurious luxurious items and so long as there's new money coming into the system the people who have access to that new money are going to want those luxuries. And that's where the real problem exists. See, if they got that new money and they held on to it or they reinvested it into their own country, into the manufacturing of their own country, then you would have something that would be a benefit to themselves. But they don't, right? They borrow money and they import. They import luxurious items. Okay? So in order to reverse this whole thing, everybody has to tighten up their belts, work extra hard, and not buy anything. Not go into luxuries, not enjoy your life, save every dime you have, and do not buy anything that will increase your standard of living. That is how you reverse it. What he is saying right there is that everybody should do exactly the opposite of what it is that they are doing. Because if you are earning money and you are spending that money to try and enjoy your life, you are doing exactly opposite of what this guy is saying that you should do, right? Nobody's going to do that. Nobody in their right mind is going to work twice as hard to earn less, right? To have less in their life. That's the problem with it. 
See, the Cantillon effect cannot be reversed. You cannot go the other way. Once you have earned that money and you have increased your standard of living, you do not want to reverse that, right? So this is where that everybody who is saying that we should fix the problem by doing these things, increase you know, the exports and decrease the imports so that we could have more of a manufacturing going on in the country, it isn't gonna happen. It isn't gonna happen because the Cantillon effect shows us that it's a cycle and that at some point the new money will turn off, all those dives into luxuries will have been the problem and everybody falls into poverty. There's no reversing of that. So anyway, I just wanted to leave that uh, article in the uh, Federal Reserve talking about how the supply chain breakdown was about 50% of the inflation that we had experienced, very much like what I was saying. And, you know, there's a Federal Reserve report talking about that. Again, whether or not you want to believe the Federal Reserve, that's, you know, up to you. I mean, all this information seems like it's propaganda to me anyway. So, all right, uneducated economists, you let me know.